Good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, to the 20th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2018. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones? And as meeting papers are provided in digital format, some of the MSPs may be using tablets uh, during the meeting to support uh, our access of, of papers. Uh, we have one apology uh, today from Kenneth Gibson, MSP, who will be suitably and ably deputised by David Torrance, MSP. So thank you very much for coming along, uh, David, and being here. And we move to agenda item one, city region deals. So today's evidence session will be the first update on city region deals following up from the committee's uh, substantial inquiry of uh, last year. Uh, following consideration of the Scottish Government's response to a report in March of this year, the committee agreed to closely monitor the progress of city region deals, and that's effectively the context of this evidence session. So can I welcome, therefore, uh, Keith Brown, Cabinet Secretary for Economy, Jobs and Fair Work. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. And can I also uh, welcome Morag Watt, Head of Region and City Partnerships Teams, and Marion McCormick, Head of Better Regulation and Enterprise Sponsorship, Scottish Government. Uh, good morning, uh, Morag and Marion. Thank you for coming along here th th this morning. Um, I should also put on the record that uh, the Scotland Office were invited to attend uh, the, this meeting. Um, it was unfortunate that our minister was not available uh, to come along, but uh, their private office has informed the clerk that they'd be happy to attend a future meeting in city region deals. Whilst we are disappointed they're not here this morning, we're keen to work constructively with the UK government going forward also. Uh, so, Cabinet Secretary, uh, I understand you've got a, an opening statement you'd like to make, and we can maybe go to questions after that. Uh, certainly, thanks, Convener. A fairly brief opening statement. I should say I'm disappointed that we haven't been able to be joined by the UK government. I think the last time we appeared before this committee was the first time I think in the history of the Scottish Parliament that we had uh, two ministers from the different governments together and of course city deals uh, as much as anything else exemplify what is a joint working relationship so uh, unfortunate but I look forward to having the opportunity in future. Uh, very pleased to be here myself this morning. In general, I think the committee's report that was produced previously is uh, very helpful, although we're at the early stages of looking at that report and taking forward its recommendations. It makes a number of important points, and you will have noted the response which I provided to the committee on the recommendations uh, and my commitment to ensuring that each one is considered uh, thoroughly. As you know, and as the committee has heard before, city-region deals are a relatively new part of the economic development landscape. The Joint Delivery Board responsible has not met since my response to the committee, but I understand that their next meeting will be on the 26th of June, and that will feature a discussion focusing on your report and how we can go forward with this transformational work. Uh, the committee will then be updated on the board's uh, consideration. For our part, the Scottish Government is committed to working in partnership to grow Scotland's economic prosperity in a way that ensures every region and local area can benefit, and that every person can benefit from new opportunities uh, to study, to work, to train and live in a safe and prosperous community. Uh, nevertheless, I do think that city deals need to be given some time to mature before a body of credible evidence on their impact can be assembled, not least given the length of time over which city deals uh, have been agreed. Uh, and since my appearance before the committee last year, I'm delighted to have secured the agreement for city region deal funding totalling £90.2 million for Stirling and Clubmanager. In addition to the investments in the city region deal, the Scottish Government will provide further investment of £5 million to deliver a new business park at Kildeen and to support the next stage of development of proposed new infrastructure at Callender. Uh, those projects were made possible by the additional investment of the Scottish Government and they have the potential to deliver further transformational growth through leverage of private sector investment of £275 million, delivering over 1,500 new jobs for the city region. Uh, tripartite discussions on the T-Cities region deal between the Scottish Government, the UK Government uh, and the regional partners are well underway. Uh, as I've always stated, our heads of terms Agreement for the Tay Cities region deal should follow on as early as possible from the Stirling and Clubmanshire City region deal. And indeed, I've written to, uh, in response to Councillor John Alexander, leader of Dundee City Council, recently stating that I am keen to support his request and that of the partners to that deal to agree a heads of terms by the end of this month. And building on the success of city region deals, I support the committee's call in their report that early agreement of a timetable for growth deals would provide reassurance to partners in areas such as Ayrshire, who have been working hard to put together exciting packages of investment for their areas. 
We are totally committed and fully focused on investing in a full growth deal for Ayrshire. I want to conclude a heads of terms as soon as possible during this year. And I'm clear that the agreement of a deal for Ayrshire is a top priority for the Scottish Government. But work is also progressing on a Borderlands growth deal. We want to ensure that the Borderlands deal complements the Scottish Government's commitment to establishing a new enterprise agency for the south of Scotland. And we have been running a series of events across the south of Scotland to hear what the people who live and work in the area want. The Borderlands deal is one of a number of deals that are currently progressing, each within their own timescale, and we are committed to agreeing those deals as soon as they are ready. So I'm pleased to be here, uh, Convener. Thank you for the invitation, and we'll try and answer any of the committee's questions. Yeah, that's very helpful, Cabinet Secretary. I might open up with a few questions, and then the conversation moves on. I know several of my committee members want to come in, and they've got very specific questions they want to ask. One of the themes I was pursuing during our evidence sessions was around uh, monies that both the Scottish and UK governments were giving that were essentially for devolved matters or for reserved matters. And I was left a little bit cold in relation to um, the bunkers that the money seemed to be put in. That's not, for me, how economic development and, and region strategically works, a devolved issue or a reserved issue. And it was creating some issues in relation to perhaps a green heads of terms in relation to how many million pounds was going for a devolved project, for a reserved project and which was actually which and defined in the first place. So I was looking over some notes um, for this morning's meeting. Um, I saw that there was a, the, there was a cash value for uh, the Glasgow deal, for the Aberdeen deal, for the Inverness deal, for the Edinburgh deal, and now for the Stirling deal. And when you add that together, if I've got my sums right, and I may not have got my sums right, Cabinet Secretary, um, over the total spend period, which can be up to two decades, it's a long time, I get that, uh, the Scottish Government's pledged £1.384 billion pounds of spending, but the UK Government's pledged £1.046 billion. Pounds. That's quite a significant difference. I'm trying to work out, given the fact that this was supposed to be about, you know, an equal funding of this strategic spend in the regions right across Scotland, why there would be that difference, and does it actually come down to issues over finding enough reserved projects to spend monies on and, and agreeing those definitions? Is that the reason there seems to be a UK government shortfall? I, I think that difference would be even greater if you examine the projects which have been supported. So, for example, in the most recent deal, the Stirling Club Manager deal, one of the projects supported by the UK government was the establishment of a national tartan centre. Now, there's no way I could see that you could say that was a reserved function, but the UK government has chosen to uh, finance that. And also the Inverness City deal, there's an industrial estate near the Longman Roundabout, which again the UK government has been willing to support, which you could say more properly lies in the devolved space. I think that the bigger issue, yes, you're right to say the Scottish government has contributed substantially more over the city deals which have been agreed so far, but it's and this is where it would have been beneficial to have input from the UK government, there has been a changing story. So on the first city deal in Glasgow, there wasn't this uh, UK government's insistence on this division between devolved and reserved projects, one being funded by one government, one by the other. There was no mention of that. In fact, there was no mention of anything. We were told almost after the deal had been agreed and just asked for over half a billion pounds for it. And then it changed um, when we got to the Aberdeen city deal, where the UK government was saying they wanted to be much more in the reserve space. But again, that wasn't applied absolutely. And then I've mentioned the Inverness deal subsequently. So I think both in terms of the insistence that it should be reserved devolved, that has been stated by the UK government, but that's not been observed in the way the deals have been agreed. And I think your other point is right. My experience has been, when we've been having the discussions with different areas, it has been more difficult, I think, for some of the partners to come up with um, projects which would be in the reserve space. And the implication of that is quite serious because if the UK government on the one hand say it should be a 50-50 split, which they've said, but then moved away from, if they say it should be a reserve devolved split, which they've said, but they've moved away from, then the partners really to try and drive up the quantum, which they will try and do naturally, want to find enough reserved projects so they can boost that and get as much uh, from the overall deal. And I think they have um, struggled um, sometimes to do that. The UK government, I think Ian Duncan may have said that himself last time he was here, uh, they have struggled to find those reserved functions. I think my own view is the best thing is to lay out what the, the basis of city deals is, and that way you've got a better chance of getting the right things coming forward from the partners. Um, 
I don't know if you've been suitably diplomatic there, Cabinet Secretary. All I know is that I want as much money spent in communities across Scotland as possible, irrespective of how it's packaged up, it's devolved or reserved. And if my sums are right and appear to be based on what you've said, Cabinet Secretary, that's around £350 million less been spent by the UK government in Scotland than the Scottish government, and it's supposed to be parity of, of funding. Is, is Scotland not getting what they should from the UK government? Are they being ripped off here? Well, it does depend, and maybe I'm being diplomatic, but it does depend on the basis of what the city deals are. If you start off from the um, position it's to be 50-50 funding, which is where we started off in the Glasgow City deal, then yes, it's not been that way. And we think we've often come up against in Aberdeen and in Inverness and in Stirling Club Manager, where the UK government has... I think it's fair to say, not met the expectations of partners in terms of the quantum. Now, we can't meet their expectations as well, because sometimes there are very high expectations. Um, but I, I think it is true to say that that unwillingness to go beyond a certain amount has left us feeling we have to go further. So in relation to Aberdeen, nearly a quarter of a billion pounds extra have been committed by the Scottish Government for some transport projects. In relation to uh, Inverness, again, we went beyond what the UK Government were willing to do, and we've just done that in relation to... Stirling Clax. Stirling Clax is, I think, is the most interesting one here, convener, because we had very early indications from the UK government that their willingness was to spend £50 million. Pounds. And then we saw, which what I can only describe as a, a fiasco, developed towards the end of that deal, where we had something like 10 different figures from the UK government in the last two weeks. We had four different figures in the last two days. On the night before, I think it was, we were told that they had suddenly changed their funding commitment from, 50, from 10 years to 15 years, that's got a huge impact on the quantum. So it, it, it's quite clear that in many cases the partners have been disappointed by the level of funding from the UK government. In some cases they may have been disappointed by the level of funding from the Scottish government. But we have tried to go further, as we've just done in the Stirling and Clarks. And you're right to say there's quite a substantial difference, uh, £1.384 billion pounds, uh, committed by the Scottish government, as I have it, and £1.04 billion pounds by the UK government. That's helpful. I mean, I wouldn't explore it further. It does look to me as if Scotland's been shortchanged with the UK government in relation to these city region deals. But as you rightly point out, the UK government's not here to give their side of the story. We look forward to them uh, appearing at committee after the summer recess, and perhaps they can explain why there seems to be a deficit of three hundred and fifty million or so in, in, in relation to that. Um, now, I would like to move to uh, the, the Glasgow deal. In, in, in particular, now that becomes quite important, Cabinet Secretary, because it was the first one. Um, there is going to be a gateway review uh, imminently, we understand. I don't know if it started yet, but our understanding is uh, that that will take place or report around December this year, the Glasgow Gateway Review. We, we, we signalled that this should be a learning experience for all, all the city-region deals. Um, and Susan Aiken, the, the chair of the, the board that, that, that's overseen the, the Glasgow city-region deal, spoke about... Um, I can't remember the terminology, but it's effectively uh, rebooting, refocusing, reprofiling to bring in the concept of inclusive growth, something that the Scottish Government says they, they wish to promote as well. Um, any news on how that's going? Uh, well, just as you've confirmed, and I think we discussed this last time, convener, before the committee, that um, you're right to say, of course, Glasgow was the first deal. It happened before Brexit was on the horizon. Um, and I think uh, Mr Simpson raised some issues about some of the partners of that deal not feeling entirely happy with some of the projects which have been submitted. There's not a great deal the Scottish Government could have done about the projects which are submitted. We responded to the request to contribute, which we did to the tune of, uh, I think, £520 million. Pounds. But because of that time that's elapsed, we have said, and I think the UK government have also said, that we are willing to look afresh at some of those projects. Um, and th there are certain criteria in that, so we'll not be looking to reopen the quantum that's been agreed, nor we want to see one council area disadvantaged at the expense of another. But beyond that, we're happy to look at anything. And that's been reflected in, um, as you said, the um, Susan Aitken, who chairs um, the relevant um, cabinet, I think it's called, in the, in the city region um, infrastructure that um, they are looking at uh, inclusive growth. I'm very pleased because that much better fits with the Scottish Government's um, e economic strategy. Um, and I do know that each of the deals has an agreed implementation plan, has different governance structures which monitor uh, delivery. And ind individual projects within the deals can also have specific review points. So um, 
uh, we said we're willing to work with Glasgow City Council, but perhaps they, they're best able, uh, they and their partners, to talk to where they're actually at with the, the process. I think that's an excellent idea, Cabinet Secretary. Maybe one of the things the committee has to look at is having Susan Aiken here to update the committee uh, and where the City Region Cabinet is in relation to uh, permitting inclusive growth throughout, throughout the package of projects in, in the City Region. Deal. I did have a very specific constituent's interest, Cabinet Secretary, it's only fair to point that out, and that is uh, Susan Aiken specifically mentioned Site Hill and the Canal in North Glasgow as having huge potential as part of that inclusive growth. And when you, when you set her here running in relation to these things, constituents at MSPs want to know how progress is going in relation to that. Uh, but also given the fact that um, the inclusive growth concept has came from the Scottish Government, bought in by this, the Glasgow City Region Cabinet. I'm delighted to see that. Um, whilst the City Region can answer for themselves, is there not also a responsibility of Scottish Government to monitor closely how that's going and actually work in partnership to see how that deal might change? And have you had any discussions with Susan Aiken in relation to what those changes might look like? Well, I mentioned, I think, the last time we appeared, we were aware of the request from not just Glasgow City Council, but others to uh, consider whether um, some of those projects could be changed. And we've made clear that we are willing to uh, agree to that. But it's not for us, just as it wasn't for us in the first place, to put forward the projects. Um, it's not for us to say how they should change. And neither would it be possible, I think, for the Scottish Government to say... We're going to renege on the basis on which we agreed that funding and you must now do this in an inclusive growth uh, manner. We're very pleased they've decided to do that themselves. And of course, yes, to answer your question directly, we will work with um, all the different partners in that deal to try and achieve that. But it, the, the impetus, as with all city deals, has to come from local partners and we will respond to that, notwithstanding, as I've said, the criteria we would apply to any changes about the quantums involved. Um, so there has been discussions with not, not just Susan Aiken but uh, council leaders across the, the city region in relation to what projects may be altered, amended, cancelled, reprofiled. Have those conversations started between the Scottish Government and partners? No, not um, directly from ministerial uh, discussions. We will respond to obviously any uh, requests that we have in writing and any requests we have for meetings on that. But we've not had formal meetings with council leaders, for example, in relation to that. There has been discussion between officials, and it may be that uh, Morag would want to add to that. But um, we've not had the direct discussions, but we remain willing to receive and consider um, constructively any proposals. Uh, yep. I'm happy to pick, pick up that, that point. Um, the um, Glasgow City Region deal is monitored at a senior official level uh, through quarterly programme liaison group meetings, the next one of which is scheduled in, in the coming weeks. Um, and we know from those meetings that the Glasgow City Region partners are in the process of looking at their entire investment programme to make sure that it is um, going to deliver maximum benefit, I think, in inclusive growth terms. Uh, we have not yet seen proposals for what that's going to look like, um, but we would expect to see that come, come forward in, in due course. OK, I'll, I'll one more rather blunt attempt to, 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 to fish out what some of these projects may or may not be under consideration. So you've not had any kind of formal proposals. There's been general discussions at a senior officer level in relation to some of this stuff. Are there any particular projects that look as if they're up for specific reviews? Appeared to, as, 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 uh, have someone given a health check and they're, they're good to go and others maybe look as if they're a bit more precarious and have to be uh, altered, amended or cancelled? Can you give us the names of any of those projects? Uh, I, could, I, I think it's worth saying, convener, that the, these are a pipeline of projects, so not all projects were ever, it wasn't the case that all projects were going to start, as you'd imagine, at the same time, so um, no, there's no um, indication, I don't think we've had any formal meetings with the council leaders to for them to suggest um, particular projects as well, but uh, it has to, as I've said, the, the, the impetus has to lie with the local authorities concerned and we're content to listen to what they have to say when they're ready to say it. OK, I, I look forward to finding out what's going to happen in relation to the Glasgow City Region deal. Perhaps we have to get them here to tease out uh, more in relation to that. Definitely some supplementaries in relation to this. I think given his uh, constituency interest, we should take Graham Simpson first in relation to Glasgow City Region deals. Thanks very much. Um, I, I just want to follow, follow up on that um, line of questioning. Um, so we think Glasgow are going to come up with new projects, maybe uh, ditch some of the old projects, um, but is, is there an actual 
timetable for this? Because we've been talking about this for months. Well, the timetable rests with the partners. They have, uh, we've agreed the projects, we've agreed the timescale over which the uh, City Deal funding will be made available, and we make that um, in relation to Glasgow on an annual basis, we make that contribution. It's for them to take it forward. I suppose the, the check or the, the control from both the Scottish and UK governments is what's called the assurance framework. We want to have some assurances around the projects which are taken forward. But I mean, I, I can't stress this point highly enough that the driving force has to be local authorities. That's the whole basis for city deals. So I don't think it's, it's um, possible for us to say what the um, councils would like to do. It is for us to respond to that when the councils are ready to say that. Though. No, I, 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 get, I get that. It has to come from the councils. and I, you know, I don't disagree with that. But the frustration of this committee, and it was our frustration last year uh, when we did our inquiry, it was a, a kind of lack of clarity. Um, or particularly around Glasgow, because that was the first the first deal, and we still have a lack of clarity. We actually don't know what they're planning to do. Um, so when are we going to find out? In fact, one of our recommendations was uh, a plea to Glasgow to tell us what they were planning. We still haven't heard that. When are we going to find out? I can't answer for for well, when we say Glasgow, we're talking about a number of different uh, local authorities and partners, but I can't answer for them. Okay. Um, so Glasgow um, is, is going to have a, a gateway review, um, but that system doesn't appear to apply to any of the other city deals. Why, why, why is that? Well, I think we've already mentioned the joint board which exists between the Scottish and UK government, and I've also mentioned the assurance framework. Those are the processes by which we would uh, seek to make sure, as you can imagine, both ourselves and the UK government have... Um, a duty in terms of taxpayers' money being spent properly, but it may be best if, if Morag comes in and answers that point. Sorry, the, the, the gateway review process is being taken forward uh, in two, two parallel ways. It's scheduled for uh, December 2019, but the work on that, as, as you note, uh, has already started. Uh, there will be a national panel which is looking uh, at UK level across the 11 city region deals across the UK uh, that have large infrastructure investment funds. There is only one in Scotland and, that, and that's Glasgow. So that, that national panel uh, will take a view on the effectiveness of the infrastructure investment programmes in delivering the economic growth outcomes within each deal yeah, and provide a, a means of, of parity, of, of comparison between all of those. Um, in parallel, and for Glasgow specifically, there is also the uh, Commission for Economic Growth that is chaired by Professor Muscatelli. Um, and that is going to look specifically at the inclusive growth outcomes that I think all of the regional partners and, and indeed Scottish Government want to see from the deal. So those two pieces of work are, are being taken forward at the moment in parallel and they will report uh, at the end of December 2019, uh, which will uh, you know, provide advice to ministers around the gateway. And to the point about other deals, so other deals will also include uh, review points. Aberdeen, I think, has one for uh, 18 months for the oil and gas uh, technology centre and a further review at three, uh, three years. And each of the city deals is obliged to produce an annual report as well. Okay. So is, is, is the idea behind this national panel to perhaps come up with a process for, for other city deals that they could use to eval evaluate? I mean, it's, it's certainly learning that we will want to take from, from the panel and, and see the extent to which that can be applied elsewhere, yes. Okay. Okay, can I just check something before I go to Alexander Stewart? I think I'm a year out. I, I thought the gateway review was going to be December this year, so it's, it's December next year. Right. Is it reasonable to say that that would be too long to wait in relation to um, any changes to the Glasgow City Region deal? Because you raise, not you, so expectations get raised by the City Region uh, Cabinet in relation to inclusive growth and ruling that out. So we should all anticipate Glasgow moving, Glasgow City Region moving way before uh, December 2019 in relation to this. Is that a reasonable thing to say? 
I, I, I think you'd have to get Glasgow to confirm that, but just as you say, convener, we've all heard about the intention of, and again, I hate to use the shorthand of Glasgow for what is a much wider uh, city region deal, but um, their intention, as you've mentioned, in relation to incorporating inclusive growth and to looking at potentially projects uh, afresh. So the timescale for that uh, independently lies with the partners. Okay, I think I know one of the action points following this meeting, Cabinet Secretary. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, convener. Cabinet Secretary, you, you've touched on the, the frustrations that there seems to be financially between the, the Scottish Government and the UK Government. Uh, are there also frustrations about economic growth and inclusive growth between the two and how that can be encapsulated? Because I'm, I'm getting a flavour that that is still the case. I, and that was a point made in the committee's report. Um, why is it the two governments appear to have different priority in relation to this? Um, I, and of course, it would be my view that I would want to, uh, I'd be delighted if the UK government also took the approach of prioritising inclusive economic growth. But I recognise the right that the UK government to have to follow their own um, uh, priority in relation to this. Um, I'm very keen that the monies which are available um, are maximised because it helps economic development right across the country. And we want to try and see that happen in a way that encourages inclusive economic growth. But the UK government have... Um, their own um, strategy for this. And I don't think, if I'm honest, or we made the case, I think this committee has made the case to the UK government previously about inclusive economic growth. Um, it's not something that comes up because we know their position. It doesn't come up a great deal in the discussions. There is, as you rightly say, far more frustration over getting some clarity and some future planning as to how these growth deals can be agreed. And there is frustration about the quantum involved. But that point has not been a regular source of conflict between the two governments. And and following on from that, you know, we, 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 we make large pronouncements when deals are coming forward. We've just had the, the Stirling and Clack Manning one and, and, and on paper uh, and on, on, on the process it all sounds amazing and fantastic. But in reality what we've seen in other deals that have had a similar trumpet uh, months and years ago that they haven't actually come to fruition as quickly as we had hoped. So the, the whole thing seems to be dragging on much longer than we'd anticipated. And, and why is that? Is it because there is still that frustration between the two governments? It, no, I don't think that is the case. So if you look, going back to the Glasgow one, we agreed very quickly the basis on which we would contribute towards that. And the onus then lies on the partners to take forward those projects. Uh, there is much more um, concern, tension. Um, for example, I had um, a nice leaflet from yourself put through my door the other day, um, which um, demanded that the Scottish... I, I would love to. Uh, unfortunately, it went straight in the bin. But um, <laughs> Recycling, uh, I hope. Recycling yes. bin, of course. We're very good at recycling, clip manager. But that, you, you made the statement the Scottish Government should have an equivalent commitment to the UK Government. Now... The frustration is that didn't happen. So the UK government not only reduced twice the amount they're willing to contribute, in relation to Clipmanager, for example, their total uh, commitment was around £40 million, although well, that was over 15 years at the last minute rather than 10. Uh, and only £8 million of that, unspecified, goes to Club Manager Council, uh, the Club Manager Council area. So there are tensions that are in there, but I, I would say, although we do have very different views on economic growth and inclusive economic growth, that is not top of the list of the tensions between us. It's much more to do with the quantum, with the projects, um, how they're divided amongst different local authorities and how fair the thing is, but not so much in terms of our different views on economic growth. But the, the, you've, you've talked about how the, the lead process is the councils themselves. Uh, but, but you must take into that cognizance that some councils do not have the same ability uh, going forward. I mean, we, we're talking about Stirling and Clack Manon specifically. Uh, and now, they are very different councils with very different objectives. They have very different ideas about what they want to achieve, but are unable to sometimes achieve that because of the constraints that they have. Uh, so, th so there is not an equal playing field in that whole city region deal and there may not be within the Glasgow deal because you've got competing uh, councils and different ones that have different aspirations and can achieve. So and, until you get that clarity and until you get that support from both or many of these organisations, it is difficult to see how they can progress uh, towards the ambitions they've set themselves out to achieve. 
Well, I suppose there's two different things there. One is you're saying quite rightly that different councils will have a different capacity in order to progress these, and we've acknowledged that, and we've provided such assistance as we can. We do have to be careful in relation to that, because otherwise it can become the Scottish Government that drives the process, and it has to be based on the priorities of local authorities. But we have tried to do that. So Club Manager, a smaller council, we have tried to provide additional assistance, and we do that for any partner that was of that scale. But there has not been... Um, in any of the deals I can think of, disputes between the different partners, different councils. I mean, even last um, uh, the last deal that we've done, the Stunning Clats one, there was remar remarkable um, unanimity and unity between the councils. Uh, but on your point about resourcing and helping with uh, especially smaller local authorities, and by and large now the growth deals will now move on to will involve smaller or individual local authorities. So we are very alive to trying to help them. The, the, the temptation is that you can start directing it, and we're, we're very keen not to given to that temptation. Thank you. Okay, uh, Jenny Gorruth. Thank you, Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I'd like to look specifically at the Edinburgh City Region deal. Um, the heads and terms were signed last July. I appreciate, obviously, it's up to local partners to drive it forward now, but are you perhaps able to provide us with an update today as to where we are with the Edinburgh City deal? Uh, well, I'll maybe ask the officials who are involved through the, the, the board, which I mentioned previously, but um, I'm well aware there were some um, substantial concerns in relation to the deal which centred around Edinburgh University and the um, uh, data uh, capabilities funded by the UK government. I understand uh, very recently that those have been uh, resolved, but it might be best if we hear from the official as to the current state. I'm not aware of any, apart from some issues you've raised yourself, of course, I'm not aware of any other issues having crept up, but perhaps uh, Morag would know more. We're continuing to work with the regional partners in, in Edinburgh, uh, all six of the local authorities and the uh, university group uh, to bring the heads of terms to a, a full deal document as, as soon as possible. When that might be? Or... We know that the regional partners are keen to take uh, the deal through their committee processes pre-recess, so it's, so it's um, as soon as we can manage that. Thank you. Um, just to go back specifically into the deal, Cabinet Secretary, one of the uh, committee report's findings was the opaque nature of how uh, projects were selected. And you, you might recall uh, Labour's David Ross telling the committee from Fife Council that he was blocked uh, by Scottish Government officials from including the Leavenmouth Rail Link, for example, in the deal, something that you contested um, at the time. Now, given the Scottish Government response to the committee stated there wasn't a general or mechanistic scoring process applied, how has the government worked to ensure deals are judged fairly? Um, and the areas like Fife are not disadvantaged by larger cities like Edinburgh or Dundee, for example? I think the, the, the issue there is that we, again, do not want to be seen to be going behind uh, what the partners have brought forward. So in relation to the Edinburgh City deal, for example, if um, when the councils and other partners collectively come to both governments and say this is the deal that we're looking to have, first of all, it's never going to be the case, and it never has been the case, that we can fund every project that's there. But we have to go on the basis that the partners themselves have agreed to the deal, and we do that. Before any heads of terms or deals announced, we have the agreement of all the partners, and we had that in relation to Edinburgh uh, uh, City Region deal. So it's not really for us to go behind that and start saying... Um, do you feel you've been fairly treated here? We do, of course, have regard to, I've just mentioned the balance as between um, Stirling Club Manager of the UK government's um, contribution. It's very light on the Club Manager side. It's only £8 million out of £40 million. But the councils themselves have agreed um, to that process. So it's not really for us to go be behind that. We have asked them, of course, to be... We ask them to be um, mindful of that fact as between different local authorities. We ask them to try and involve the private sector. Uh, and we ask them to involve their communities. But the way in which they do that has to be down to local authorities. The whole basis of it, as I've said, is that they should drive the process. OK, um, do you want to supplement you on that, Mr Torrance? Um, Cabinet Secretary, can you update us on what progress has been made in expanding coverage to parts of Scotland that don't have a deal? We've had some progress in relation to that. So after um, many months of asking, uh, the UK government has now publicly stated that it will support an Ayrshire growth deal. Now, the Ayrshire growth deal has been discussed for a long time now. Um, and what seems to have happened is that um, a lot of focus has gone on to the Borderlands deal. And um, we have said from the start that we're committed to, in fact, I think it was the former First Minister that first committed to a Borderlands deal. 
So we've said we're committed to that, and I've also said repeatedly to the UK government it's only right that we tell the rest of Scotland that we intend to support them. Now, we will do that. The Scottish Government will do um, a growth deal for every part of Scotland. Obviously, more can come out of that if we work together with the UK Government, but we don't yet have the assurance that that will be the case, nor do we have any um, assurance as to if we are working together, what the basis of working together, will it be 50-50, will it be a reserve-devolved split? We don't have that information yet, but we are grateful for the fact that um, the UK Government has now agreed a deal for Ayrshire, and they are very intent on a deal for Borderlands as well, but that still leaves Argyll and Butte, Murray, Falkirk, other parts of the country as well. Can I just check in relation to some of the, the delays in agreeing the, the head the head the heads of terms? Um, is that just going back just, just for putting on the record and we'll go back to colleagues again? But is some of the delay in agreeing heads of terms go back to that original question I asked about some finding suitable projects that could be deemed to be reserved? Not in the heads of terms because that tends to come after we've agreed the deal. So that that issue would come up before agreeing the deal rather than the heads of terms. So heads of terms. What about the the specifics in the deal itself? Yep. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Um, on, on the specific point as well, yes. yeah, Graham Simpson. To follow up, actually, and it, so it's in, re, in in relation to the areas of Scotland that don't currently have deals, and um, your commitment to give them deals. So you mentioned a number of councils. I mean, Falkirk, for instance. I mean, can you actually in, in, envisage a situation where Falkirk would just have its own deal? Well, well yes, uh, and I think we have said that we want to. Again, just to make the point that we don't say to particular councils you should band together to have a deal. Um, we don't prescribe how that happens. So if that is the case, and if you want to take it with an equitable approach, everybody should have the opportunity. So we're not willing. Now Falkirk could, you know, uh, conceivably part with another authority, but you've already seen the Edinburgh City Region deal. You've already seen the Stirling Club Manager deal. Um, but yes, we're not for that reason because the councils have come forward in that. Um, that makeup, we're not going to say to Falkirk, no, you can't have a deal. And also, the UK government, I think, is committed to, I think, um, a Murray is still a bit unclear, a, a deal for Murrayshire uh, on its own as well. So I think we are in that position now of having to consider an individual. Look, Ark Island Butte would be another one as well. How do you think that would that would actually work? Uh, well, we haven't done them, so we can't say, but it seems to be pretty much along the lines of those deals which have already been done. So if you go to Murray Council, they've already come up and talked to both governments about a list of projects they'd like to see funded. Mm -hmm. But how it would actually work is difficult for me to say when I don't yet know the extent, the nature and the basis of the UK government's potential involvement. Now, there will come a point when eventually we'll have to say we're just going to get, and we came very close to that point with the Ayrshire growth deal, we're just going to go ahead and work with, the, in that case, number of local authorities. Uh, but we would rather it was done on the basis of both governments if we can do that. Yeah. Okay. okay, Andy White. Uh, thanks very much, uh, convener. Um, so with um, the existing deals and Edinburgh having heads of terms and Ayrshire being uh, committed to, etc. What, what lessons have has the Scottish Government learnt um, in the process so far that it's applying through the funding it's giving to new city region deals? I think it's true to say, as uh, maybe more I would want to add to this, that we are um, learning lessons all the time from this. So, um, in relation to the Edinburgh city region deal, um, perhaps. Um, the confusion which seems to have arisen in relation to uh, university projects um, is best avoided by being much more clear about the basis on which support is being provided. That seems to be being, being resolved now, so we've learnt a lesson in relation to that. I think the biggest lesson has been, as we've moved through the city deals, that um, the different local partners have realised if it is merely a list of um, desired infrastructure projects that will not uh, achieve that transformational change. So I think you've seen over time uh, things like um, uh, much more in terms of the digital space, in terms of uh, some training as well, and um, a more rounded approach to city deals as we've gone on. But in addition to those lessons, I think some of the factors pointed out by the committee in its report, the recommendations, are also being considered, not just by uh, ministers, but by different elements have mentioned the board already. And they are looking at those things uh, along the lines of how we can make these more transparent. Um, and also, I think, 
I suppose one of the lessons is rather than having to join the process as we did in the Glasgow City Region deal at the very end of the process, it's much better to give as much certainty uh, as to the basis of future deals to potential future partners. So I think those are the obvious lessons, but it might be worth hearing convener from Morag as well in relation to that. Hi, happy to add to that. Um, we are always absolutely willing to, to learn from what has gone before. And one of the um, recommendations that we make to, sorry, we, it's, it's me and my team that, that go out and engage with the local authorities in, 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 in developing the deals um, or as they develop their deal proposals. And one of the things that we will always tell each local authority is go and talk to your compatriots who already have deals because quite a lot of the learning that they can take is, is how those things are, are better delivered. Uh, so whether that's going to talk to Aberdeen uh, in terms of how they've set up their, their accountable officer functions or how, how they have... Um, worked uh, across the region to set up governance structures that allow them to, to work together more effectively. That peer-to-peer -peer learning, uh, I think, is, is very helpful for them. Uh, I think the other thing that we have learned as the, the various different deals have progressed uh, over time, uh, it came out last year in the Enterprise and Skills Review, uh, where phase two of that recognised that there were clear lessons to be learned from the governance put in place for, for earlier deals. Um, and that there were certain characteristics that made uh, sex successful partnership delivery more effective uh, and more likely to, to happen better. Um, and that's why there was a recommendation last year that the private sector should have clear representation in all the new regional economic partnerships uh, that, that, that go with the, the, the new city region deals, um, something that we, we built on uh, from the, the Aberdeen City Region deal, which has uh, Opportunity North East as part of its joint committee. And, and Cabinet Secretary, you talked about the difference between a list of projects and what um, um, Scottish Government money is seeking to achieve, which is transformational change. Can you give a, an illustration of what transformational change means in comparison to, to just a list of projects? I think, well, if, if you take the city deal with which I'm sure you'll be most familiar is the Edinburgh City Region deal, in that deal we saw, rather than just a list of infrastructure projects, things in terms of employability and skills. Um, now, I think initiatives based on that can be transformational in making sure that people who can't access uh, the jobs market because of a lack of not just opportunities, but because of the skills uh, requirements, I think that can be transformational. I think if you think of the Aberdeen City deal, I think um, the focus for the first time that took place here on connectivity and digital uh, connectedness, I think that can be transformational um, for Aberdeen, Aberdeenshire, not least if you can, as you'll know, increase connectivity, digital connectivity for uh, especially rural areas, then you can increase employment, health and education opportunities. And I think those are some examples of how it can be transformative. So in relationship to the National Evaluation Framework for the, the Gateway Review, why is that only look at infrastructure if, it's, if some of the things that you're seeking to achieve are in the, in the sort of employability and skills, the areas that you argue are transformative? Um, well, I think we are looking at the other areas, but not necessarily th through that process. So the outputs of the innovation projects, some of which I've mentioned already, uh, and in particular the employability projects, are comparatively clear. They're fairly self-evident. And how many people, for example, were supported, how many businesses were able to expand and take up new business space, each of those, I think, can be evaluated on its uh, own merits fairly straightforwardly. I think, though, in relation to the infrastructure investment, that uh, can be different. So the national panel is seeking to go beyond uh, measuring the outputs, such as how, how many miles of road um, or new railway um, or uh, increased capacity on the railway, uh, how many acres uh, in relation to, say, for example, the Inverness deal. I mentioned the, the Longman roundabout and the industrial site next to that that has to be remediated. Uh, and to try and determine the economic outcomes of those projects. I think that's what the uh, National Evaluation Framework is trying to do. But once again, it would be, uh, given Morag is heavily involved in that, worth hearing from Morag on that. So I, I think I think that's um, absolutely right, that, that certain projects uh, can be measured uh, in terms of their projects and the, the, the infrastructure investment programme, because it's it's of a different scale is is being considered by the the the, 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 the national panel 
and, and that's been a, a specific procurement exercise for those specific 11 deals. Um, we can certainly take the learning from that, and we will be taking the learning from that and seeing the extent to which it can be applied to deals elsewhere. But the, the procurement uh, process is, is well underway now. Um, uh, moving on, when did, when did the Joint Delivery Board last meet? It last met um, in January, and it meets again in two weeks' time. Um, so, um, given the importance of that um, board, and given that some of the committee recommendations were, uh, the Scottish Government, in fact, said that the board would very specifically look at them, presumably that's on the work programme we're going to participate hearing in a couple of months' time. Yeah, I think I said that in my um, uh, opening statement, that they intend to consider the committee's recommendations at the meeting on the 26th of June. Um, the Centre for Regional Inclusive Growth, has that launched yet? Well, we plan to launch that this month. Um, we have done a, quite a bit of work in relation to this, so it provides uh, practical assistance uh, to the regional partnerships. I think it's probably true to say they're at different stages. So in relation to um, Glasgow, a real appetite and progress being made there. We have seen, if you like, other developments such as in the Ayrshire, the different um, economic development agents coming together in terms of a Pathfinder uh, project there, but um, the centre itself uh, will launch uh, later this month. And we understand the centre is going to be effectively a website hosted by the Scottish Government. So what, how, how will that work proactively to encourage good practice and assistance with evaluating projects? I think it's exactly that. It's the basis on which, uh, and it won't just be uh, virtual, you'll have the people involved in this meeting regularly. So it sits on top of, for example, if you have a regional economic partnership in Ayrshire, the different uh, councils will be speaking to each other on a regular basis, as you will do with Scottish Enterprise and SDS. So this sits on top of that. It allows that exchange and analysis to take place um, at that, if you like, kind of national level. But once again, if the entire nature of it is about... Uh, local or regional collaboration, that's where the drive should come from. We can try and provide assistance uh, with that, but it should be driven by local partners. Although I have said previously that for my part, if they want to come together to uh, look at new initiatives, I said this in relation to the Enterprise and Skills Review, then we would look at how Scottish Enterprise and Skills Development Scotland, even the Funding Council, can play their part in those local partnerships. But this would be um, a basis and a, a forum for the them to exchange their experience and ideas and uh, what's what's happened up to that point. Okay, thank you. Okay, you Going back to Andy Whiteman's original line of questioning, which was about lessons learned, um, I wonder to what extent any cross-portfolio work has taken place or might in the future in terms of joining up uh, the government's aspirations around closing the poverty-related attainment gap and inclusive growth. And the reason I ask is because Leave Mouth Academy, which is actually in my colleague David Torrance's constituency, is the second highest recipient, or it was rather, last year of pupil equity funding. So I wonder, therefore, if there's an opportunity to, to tie up those two government aspirations in terms of inclusive growth and closing that poverty-related uh, attainment gap. There is, um, although, uh, again, and I hate to have to continue to rest on this, but we do take the starting point as being the initiatives from the local authorities, but you're right to say in terms it makes sense for the government to do this in a cross-portfolio basis. So we've had a number of meetings across portfolios and education have been involved in that. I can't say what the process is uh, for the UK government, but we are, and I think that's something we've got better at doing as, a, as the growth deals have, have um, progressed. But yes, there is a scope to do that, but we'd want to take an initiative from the local authorities concerned that they wanted us to do that. But we, for our part, will want to try and take decisions based on uh, the support we give on a cross-portfolio basis. Yep. Okay. Now, can I just double-check also in relation to Andy Whiteman's point, one of the things that jumped out to myself was back to that monitoring of uh, city region uh, growth deals again. So we're going to have the, this uh, strategic board and Scottish city region deal delivery group and we've got the, the hub. I noticed from my notes that uh, phase two of the Enterprise and Skills Review is the, has been the development of an inclusive growth monitoring framework. So finished, complete, but good to know where that is. And the Scottish Government Inclusive Growth Diagnostic and Forthcoming Measurement Framework. Not sure if that's the same thing or connected. But the reason for mentioning those is in that context, irrespective of whether it's the gateway review that Glasgow City Region deal has or whatever Aberdeen set up or Inverness has set up, 
if these diagnostic tools exist, we'll be expect every city region deal to run through this diagnostic tool to actually get the extent to which inclusive, inclusive growth has been achieved. Is that a common framework for monitoring we've got there? Uh, no, and I, I think if you go back to the basis on which the deals were originally agreed, so I mentioned the Glasgow City deal, um, that, that is perhaps the reason why, as you mentioned yourself, Convener, that um, Glasgow and its partners have said they want to um, pursue inclusive economic growth in relation to their city deal. The last deal that we've done, the Stirling Clamanshire deal, it was the case that the councils themselves looked at that diagnostic tool and they themselves tried to assess the proposals they were putting forward in terms of inclusive economic growth. And we, in our response uh, and our support that we provide, want to have regard to that as well. But um, the other deals were not uh, constructed on that basis. So the extent to which they pursue inclusive economic growth rested on the projects put forward by the partners and the ones which we were willing to fund. I mean, I get the fact that diagnostic tool is about predicting how, how what inclusive growth might look like once you commit to the head of terms and the projects and the funding and everything else, but the inclusive growth monitoring framework would appear to be a common framework to actually work out, well, the diagnostic tool might show one thing, but actually the monitoring framework shows it, it did better in terms of inclusive growth or it did worse or whatever. Will there be a co Is this an opportunity for a common monitoring framework across all deals? It is, but uh, the point I was trying to make is that the earlier deals will rest upon the willingness of the partners to apply that uh, framework. We can certainly apply it as to what we've helped to fund, but as to whether the councils and other partners involved in the deals want to apply that, that's a decision for them to take. Cabinet Secretary, I get that's a decision for them to take. Could you imagine a good reason for not wanting to apply a consistent, reliable monitoring framework across all 32 local authorities that have signed up to city region deal such as an inclusive growth monitoring framework. Do you think of a good reason not to do that? I can't think of a good reason, although I think it's worth pointing out in response to the questions raised by Alexander Stewart, that is not the basis on which the UK government has supported their part of the deals. I'm not saying they're against inclusive economic growth, but that is not the basis on which they've granted that. But I no, I can't think of a good reason why not to use that as a framework to see the extent to which you're achieving inclusive economic growth. Or that's helpful as well, but other monitoring frameworks that might show that gross value added, added could have been even higher had city region deals not incorporated it. Inclusive economic growth are two different models, they're two, they're two different concepts, that's fine, but I would just want to make sure that every city region deal is going through a common monitoring framework, because that's one of the issues the committee has had, that everyone is monitoring in different ways and therefore maybe achieving outcomes, but, but with different methodologies, and that doesn't give consistency or comparisons, so that's quite helpful, I think you've put that on the record, Cabinet Secretary. Um, a very patient Monica Lennon, MSP. I've never been described as patient before, but there's a first time for everything. Good morning. Um, I wasn't a member of the committee during the, the inquiry into city region, de region deals. So in some respects, I am playing catch up. Um, Cabinet Secretary, can you talk me through the ways in which city region deals take regard of the broader context that they function in? Um, and by that, I mean, how do they integrate and complement with other strategies? I think I've, I've mentioned uh, previously, I understand the point that you've been involved in the inquiry previously, the genesis really of um, city region deals, the first of those was the Glasgow um, city region deal. And unfortunately that was one where the Scottish government weren't involved in its development. It was uh, developed with the UK government and local authorities and then coming to the Scottish government uh, with the ask to be a funding partner to the tune of £520 million, which we agreed to do. A lot has happened since that time, so not in, not um, excluding, of course, the Enterprise and Skills Review. So I know that the board, Strategic Board, is wanting to look at the economic development impact and the inclusive growth impact of the deals which have taken place. And over and above that, we've mentioned already the annual reports, which are, uh, uh, the different partnerships are obliged to provide, which provide some assessment of the impact of the deals as well. And within the officials, some, some of whom are here today, there will also be ongoing analysis of the impact of the deals that we've had. So there is, uh, uh, and of course, the committee itself and other committees of the parliament will want to have a look at that as well. So uh, there's quite a lot of scrutiny as to how, although we are still at an early stage of city deals, how they are impacting on the economy. OK. Um, the committee's just um, been looking at the planning bill. So is there a formal connection between the city region deals and the national planning framework, the NPF being the, the spatial expression of the Scottish government's economic strategy? 
Yes, we expect that local authorities and others, when they make proposals, will have regard, of course, uh, that changes over time, the national planning framework, but will have regard to that. And as you'll know, I'm sure both from here and from your local authority experience, there's quite a close connection between economic development uh, and planning. Uh, we have tried, um, and certainly I did when in local government myself, to try and encourage uh, local authorities to have an approach which wasn't just about development control, which was about... Uh, I can give an example of Moan Local Authority. We changed <coughs> the name of the planning department from um, development control to enterprise and environment to try and encourage the idea that what local authorities should be doing is not just saying why well, you can't develop this in this way, but how you could achieve what you want to achieve consistent with planning regulations and how you can also foster economic development. And if that is true at a microcosmic level, then it is true, I think, that local authorities um, in they, they are making forward their proposals um, for... Uh, city deals are cognizant of the planning framework. The one thing we have been very clear to say, and it would be interesting to hear more of you in this as well, is that none of the uh, projects that we agree to can be assumed as giving Scottish Government Ministers consent for anything that requires planning processes to be gone through afterwards. So there's nothing implicit, and we make that very, nothing implicit to say, you know, a particular road, that's not us saying we are giving consent because Scottish ministers can often be asked to play a part in the planning process. So we don't imply that, and it has to be up to the partners and local authorities to progress the, the, the planning. I don't know if you want to add to anything that more. Just, just to, to echo the point that uh, agreement within the city deal context doesn't bypass any of statutory processes. Sure, and I understand that, and I, you know, I welcome the way the cabinet secretary has characterised that shift in language and, and planning. Absolutely, should be um, an enabler. I wonder then, on a sort of very practical level, if we, if we take Glasgow, um, that's the region uh, where I am, um, in terms of city deal context, what is the relationship between regional planning in the Glasgow region and, for example, Clyde Plan? Is there synergy between the two? I think that really is a question for the partners to answer, because it, it, only because they're the ones that put forward the projects, they'll know the context in which they put those uh, forward, and the extent to which it was taken into account at the time would have to be something for them to answer, I'm afraid. Okay. I just you know, wonder to what extent government takes an interest that these approaches and strategies are, are joined up. I think I would go back to, to what I said previously. We, we do want to see um, a joined-up approach. We want to see um, local authorities and others involving the private sector, and we've had, I think it's fair to say, some challenges in doing that, encouraging um, some of the partners to make sure there's really meaningful dialogue. I would say Stirling Council were very good at having done that over a period of time. Um, and uh, we also want to see them taking forward their communities with them. But we don't want to end up um, in a position of um, insisting on how they carry out those uh, consultations or the extent to which they take into account different factors when they put forward the projects. Otherwise, the accusation would be um, that the government was seeking to pick and choose on the basis of... Uh, criteria other than the ones that they use, both the UK government and ourselves. So it is for local authorities to make sure they do make that cross um, reference between their different uh, strategies and plans. And just sticking with strategic development plans before I move on, um, Cabinet Secretary, have you got any sense um, as to whether SDPs, where they exist in a city region deal context, um, are adding value? Are there any sort of positive examples, whether it's in, um, you know, Clyde Plan, for example, or the CES Plan? Is, is there any synergy between them? Well, I think what we've seen, again, I go back to the point, is for local authorities to try and uh, achieve that uh, synergy. But a number of the projects which have been proposed in different city region deals have drawn on those plans. Uh, and I know that that's the case. Um, and that's probably more evident in relation in particular to infrastructure proposals which have come forward as well. But the point I was making is it's really for the local authorities to do that. And it's perhaps not surprising if local authorities individually or jointly have worked on a strategic plan that some of the priorities in that plan will be reflected in the proposals they put forward for a city deal. So there's a natural um, link there. And to the extent that strategic development plans have involved, as they must do, joint working, some long-term thinking and by its nature, strategic thinking, then it's only right that is used as a basis for uh, projects coming forward. Thank you, that's helpful. I think people want to know that projects haven't just been plucked out of thin air and there is a strategic long-term approach. Um, sticking with the, the planning bill, if you'll indulge me, uh, convener, 
The equalities impact assessment for the bill has been identified as a weakness by Engender and the committee is grateful that the local government and housing minister is actively looking at this again. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I know that you have said previously that the aim of generating inclusive growth is the golden thread running through the Scottish government's economic strategy and the 2018-19 budget committed um, the government to look at um, equality impact assessing the, the city region deals. Can I ask for, <coughs> for an update on that, please? Uh, yes, I, I think, first of all, we are aware of the fact that the public authorities which are involved in these city deals have got obligations in terms of the equality impact, and we expect them to follow through uh, on those um, obligations. Can I just very quickly go back to one point uh, on your previous question, which was... I think the very reasonable point that you expect and people would expect a strategic underpinning or some coherent thought around the projects which are chosen. Well, I think for the first time, the Stirling Clipmanager Plan had one which evidently wasn't. It was a dollop of cash to be provided, £8 million, over a 15-year period, which required the council, after they'd signed uh, the city deal, to come up with what they intended to do with it. We've never seen that before in a city deal. And it, it, I don't want to overstress the extent to which that city deal was unlike any previous city deal in terms of how it changed repeatedly late on, in terms of the balance of, of support that's provided for different uh, local authority areas, um, and also to change at the last day from uh, what was agreed as a 10-year timescale to a 15-year timescale is a fundamental change. If you just think, if you're going to spend that money over a much longer period, you have lesser impact. But the other thing which we shouldn't let um, uh, go by, and it might be something that's entirely of course for the committee they want to look at, is why it would be the case you would agree a project, £8 million, in fact the only project agreed by the UK government in that council area, which has got no plan behind it. There is no basis other than the fact it's to be in the reserve space. There is no... Uh, now that is that's quite a, an important departure from the way that city deals have been constructed and to the point that you made... I don't know how you can say that. It takes into account any strategic thinking behind it. But that's uh, perhaps for the uh, committee to explore. Important mm. point, Cabinet Secretary. I mean, what's your understanding of that? I mean, that £8 million that you've described, which appears to be kind of open-ended, um, was there any um, sort of justification or explanation given for that? Uh, frankly, I don't think there was, and that would have been the benefit of having the UK government here to, to answer that. But I, I just I would point out, and, and the committee um, will be aware of the projects which have been funded from all the different deals which have been done. You won't find anything like that. £8 million we will give you if you come up within one year or with a business case for how you intend to use it. Now, there are reasons why that is, is so out with the way that we've done city deals that are worth examining. I don't have an answer to, to the question, but um, only the UK government uh, would be able to answer it, I think. Um, on the equality impact assessments, I don't know if you want to say more on that. The, the Cabinet Secretary, in his earlier response to the Committee's recommendations, I think, uh, made, made clear that, that uh, you know, there, there is already a statutory duty on, on public authorities to, to carry out uh, equality impact assessments. Uh, as they, they take forward their different projects. And we would expect to see those come through uh, and, and be clearly articulated in business cases, that the qualities and the sustainability issues should, should be picked up in, in, in the business cases. I was looking back at the, the committee's report on this issue and impact assessments had only been carried out in Aberdeen and Inverness, so not Glasgow and Clyde, uh, Valley Region, where I am. Um, in the report... There was some explanation given. It said that this was partly due to the fact that data on protected characteristics is limited at the regional level. I just wonder then if, if you're able to um, give a wee bit more expansion on that and what other factors. I'm just wondering what are the barriers to, to doing this properly and are we having to go back retrospectively and look at projects? Is, is that the work that you're doing? So I think there are two points in there. One is the, the Glasgow City Region deal, whereby the government investment into that uh, is through the Infrastructure Investment Fund, but it is for the regional partners to identify the projects uh, within that. And therefore, the project assessment uh, and the qualities impact of the projects will be done at the, the regional partner level. Um, so, so that is one part of it. In terms of the data available uh, on uh, groups with protected characteristics, 
it can be quite difficult to get that at, at the regional levels for, for the larger regions, for, for, for Glasgow and for Edinburgh. It's, it's less problematic. Uh, when we look at uh, Stirling Club Manager, for example, um, the, the data may well not be there. We haven't started that one yet, but we're certainly in the process of looking at the Edinburgh City Region uh, Equality Impact Assessment. Um, what we have done is we have worked with the Equality and Human Rights Commission to find other ways in which those things can be considered and approached. Um, and through the work of the Equality and Human Rights Commission, there have been a number of uh, engagements with local authorities who are carrying out uh, city deal uh, investments to look at how they can um, maximise the benefits of um, those, those investments for for uh, groups with protected characteristics. And indeed, that's a, a formal part of each uh, grant offer letter that goes out uh, with City Deal funding, that there should be active uh, engagement with, with uh, the Equality and Human Rights Commission. No, that's helpful. I appreciate it. it's work in progress. I just wonder, can you give any examples about the type of data that, that is hard to get? When you say it's difficult to get some of the data, I just wondered what you mean by that. Well, the, the, the volumes tend to be quite low uh, in, in terms of, of particular uh, groups of, of disabled uh, people that, that may be captured by the legislation. So uh, getting statistically valid numbers uh, is, is where we, we can struggle with, with smaller regions. OK, thank you. OK, we're nearly at the end of our, our evidence session. Might just mop up on one or two things. The Sterling Click Manager deal, just, just to come back to that again, if you, if you don't mind, Cabinet Secretary. Um, so we mentioned the inclusive growth diagnostic um, uh, earlier, um, so we can assume that the Stirling Click Manager deal used the inclusive growth uh, diagnostic tool before it, it, it finally agreed what projects were going forward. Is that correct? So I think the point I'd made is that those councils had chosen to use that in terms of the projects that we were putting forward and in the Scottish Government's contribution to it, we want to reflect that in the things that we're supporting as well. Does that mean all the projects in Stirling Click Manage are deal with exception of £8 million that's not been spent yet uh, or committed to anything yet? Has that been through that diagnostic tool? I I think it's fair, fair to say that the diagnostic identifies what the issues are within the, the regional economy that may need to be addressed. It doesn't then go as far as to saying what interventions are going to address those. So there may be a range of different interventions that will address those particular issues that have been identified through the diagnostic if that makes sense. So that so that even having done the diagnostic and the, the Sterling Club Manager Councils did do the diagnostic to see which areas um, they, they needed to address within the regional economy, it then gave them a range of options to 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 deal with those and to tackle those. And it is something that we will absolutely be continuing to monitor through the progress of the deal to see the extent to which those interventions are hitting those measures. And just to give you a flavour convener on uh, some of the ways in which I think that will be reflected, if you look at the projects, certainly which the Scottish Government is supporting, so the Environment Centre is the biggest project which the Scottish Government is supporting, and that, apart from uh, the environmental aspects of it, is to try and drive up, uh, especially in Club Manager, the availability of uh, well-paid jobs. You also have the Digital District and the Digital Hub, which is trying to drive up the levels of inclusiveness in terms of access. Uh, I mentioned before how digital inclusion can include education, health and employment opportunities. Also in terms of the skills and inclusion programme, um, that again is, is sought to try and um, support inclusive economic growth. So those are some of the things that we're trying to do. You could contrast that, if you like, going back to Alexander Stewart's points about the different approach between the two governments. The biggest contribution which the UK government is making is to research uh, or to the Agriculture Centre at Stirling University, much more um, around a, a, um, perhaps a GVA approach uh, towards uh, growth rather than the one that we've taken. But the diagnostic tool doesn't, that is helpful, the diagnostic tool doesn't give a number at the end of it and say, well, actually, uh, taken into account of inclusive growth, the GVA would be a higher number than the raw GVA figure. That's not what it's doing. What it's doing is it, 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 you're running through potential projects to identify where it may or may not assist inclusive growth rather than coming up with them. Um, uh, numbers around that is that is that a reasonable thing to say? Yes, and I think even the GVA um, 
uh, criteria. It's not one that's without its limitations. Um, so if you try to compare the two uh, as the main criteria for how you have to fund projects, you would find that difficult to do. I think I think people, uh, the other um, forum, the Economic Jobs and Fair Work Committee of this Parliament has taken forward a pretty exhaustive investigation into economic stats and the limitations, and one of those is GVA. So. And it's, it's probably true to say that no uh, economic measurement is, is perfect, but we would certainly want to try and uh, favour economic development, which is inclusive rather than just straightforward growth. Yeah, I'm just, I mean, the thing is, it's easy, and we, we all do it as politicians around this table. We, we use terminologies and, and, and we talk about this model or that model or this matrix or that quantum. And scratch means the surface the level of understanding can be pretty, not talking about yourself, Cabinet Secretary, but the level of understanding can be relatively limited, let's be honest, and we, we hide behind the terminology um, to justify what we do sometimes. So uh, I'm generally trying to get my head around what an inclusive growth diagnostic would look like. So for myself, I think it would be helpful to see details of that uh, in, in, in real time. So for example, in Stirling, Clickman and Shire, maybe... Ten potential projects were scoped out, but six were agreed upon and four weren't. But some of those rejected might have modelled at greater GVA, but they weren't selected because other ones modelled better at inclusive growth. That's the kind of thing, without all the gobbledygook around it, that's the kind of straightforward thing that we would quite like to see so we can touch it, feel it, smell it, and find out exactly what it does. Is that the kind of thing the Scottish Government can help us with? Yeah, I can help you certainly with the detail that you're looking for in terms of the diagnostic. But if you think about what you've asked there, so you'd want to, before taking a decision, have a picture in the round of the projects which are likely to be supported. And we don't have that. The UK Government will do the projects that it's going to propose, now, and we will end up doing the ones that we want to propose. To me, I think... The first of your question is exactly right. You're much better to have a whole picture of which, which projects have been taken forward so you can work out what the balance is between straightforward growth. If in Clipmanishire we were to create 100 jobs for PhD students, um, that's not going to make a huge impact um, in itself on the unemployment figures in Clipmanishire, which are some of the most challenging in the country. So that wouldn't necessarily help inclusive growth. Or if you do something which helps the economic output of the area, that doesn't of itself necessarily lead to inclusive growth. So the, the point I'm making is, and it goes back to Alexander Stewart's points, if both governments, and you've made this point yourself previously, if both governments were convinced that inclusive economic growth was the way to go, then that, that ability to analyse the impact of what you're doing is much greater. But we don't. We have two different um, priorities attached to the government. But I'm happy to provide as much information as I can. Some of that information, I think, might be um, commercially confidential, but we're trying to minimise that. But in terms of the di diagnostic and the way that we apply it, I'm happy to provide the committee and yourself can do as much information as we can. I think that would be helpful. The committee would report we welcome the move to inclusive uh, economic growth for Glasgow. We didn't uh, committee position more generally on whether it was gross value added, added the raw figures or, or, or inclusive growth. The committee didn't have a position on that, but we did say we welcome what was happening in Glasgow. There may be different views on the committee, but irrespective of the views on the committee, I think we want to better understand what it actually looks like, so I think that would be really helpful. Uh, final question from myself. You mentioned this £8 million that um, can be spent on a project once the project has been identified. And right at the start of our evidence session, we identified approximately £350 million that wasn't spent by the UK government. I called a shortfall, but you were quite diplomatic about it, Cabinet Secretary. Um, is that £350 million that could be sitting in a fund somewhere to local authorities or city regions identify how they'd like to spend it in a way that the UK government's content to sign off? Or is that money just lost to Scotland? can only be answered, uh, I think, by the UK government. But the, the example you've given is, and as I say, this is quite an extraordinary development that you would agree. And that, that 8 million figure changed, I think, two or three times during the course of the last two or three days uh, that happened. Um, but, you know, you, this committee is quite rightly trying to get to grips with the nature of city deals. I don't know how announcing you're going to put £8 million into... Well, nothing really. You're waiting to see what comes forward subsequent to having signed the deal. 
Uh, and also, another part of that deal was, for example, uh, and again, this is why it's frustrating not to have, in particular, Lord Duncan here, because the commitment had previously been given by Lord Duncan in relation to MOD land, both in Angus and in Stirling, that land would be transferred at no cost and remediated at the cost of the UK government. Now, they um, resiled on that, so they attached a £5 million cost, although that figure also changed, I think, four times in the last week uh, of that deal. Um, they attached a £5 million notional cost, which then was added to the £40 million. So that took them to the £45.2 million. And it's not been remediated. And to decontaminate that land is going to be a substantial challenge for the council. So these are departures from what have been, uh, what's been done before in city deals and a previous commitment in that case, by a specific commitment by the UK government to the local authority and myself concerned. And I just, I just question how... You know, the, the things which this quite, uh, committee is quite rightly concerned about is this, the substantial basis for taking forward city deals can be achieved in those kind of late changes and reversals. I put that pretty clearly on the record, Cabinet Secretary. We'll ask those questions after the summer recess when we get the opportunity to do that. I suppose what I'm trying to do is tease out the Scottish Government position in relation to the lost £350 million. If, if £8 million was identified because it had to be put in to make up the UK Government side of of the deal to make it balance out in terms of funding. Couldn't that have been done for the £350 million that was unspent in relation to all the previous deals? So is the Scottish Government's position that, well, we're disappointed the UK Government, that's a £350 million lost to Scotland, or is the Scottish Government's position that's £350 million that Scotland should still get, even if it's unsatisfactory as it is in the same way that Stirling and Clark got it, and that is assign it to the city regions, let them plan how they want to spend it, and if the UK government has to sign off on that, then so be it. But it's their money, and they should be able to direct and spend it. So is the Scottish government position that it's a shortfall and the money's lost, or is the Scottish government's position it's a shortfall and the region should get the money back? Well, if you're asking me if I think the UK government could usefully give £300 million to the successive local authorities, then I would very much uh, welcome that. And I think in each or in some of the city deals, we have sought to go further and the UK government has reined back on that and they're entitled to do that. We have tried to nevertheless go beyond that. So it's very substantial in relation to the Aberdeen deal, uh, in relation to the Inverness deal, now in relation to the Stirling and Clax deal. But it is in the final analysis that the answer to that question is, I know the Scottish government's position, we would like to see more money being spent in Scotland, but as to why it's not been is only for the UK government to answer, I think. That didn't actually answer my question, which is, is the Scottish Government's position that some of this money should be assigned to the, to, to the, to the city region deals that missed out or not? It, the, the decision has... Uh, no, I, I would like to see. It's self-evident from the way we've tried to construct the deals. We've tried to get a larger quantum. But as now, we have agreed with the UK Government, those city deals, where we feel they haven't gone long enough, uh, far enough, we have agreed that deal on the basis of 50-50, and then we have sought to go further than that ourselves. And that accounts for some of the difference that you mentioned, the £300 million. Pounds. So we have chosen to go further. We would like the UK to government to have gone further, but we accept we have signed the city deals, the local partners have signed those city deals. But nevertheless, if there's £300 million pounds here that could have come, then of course we'd like to see that come to Scotland. Yeah. Officials will, will, will not thank me for asking this, but it'd be quite good, because I'm just using the numbers that, that I had there, it'd be quite good to get a detailed breakdown of those numbers, because it's only fair to the UK government to identify where it was the Scottish Government going further because they just wanted to go further, or where it was the Scottish Government going further because the UK Government couldn't find enough reserved, lay badged up projects for them to spend further money, in which case for me that would be a shortfall, but it would be quite good to actually get a, de a detailed breakdown on that so that I'm not just asking the same questions again to the UK Government when they arrive, we can actually, answer, we can actually dig beneath that and find out whether uh, I'm chasing shadows here or whether this is a substantive loss to Scotland, which is what I'm really trying to, to, to get behind. I think I, obviously, the best people to provide that clarity are the UK government, but I can confirm my point of view is they've never reined in uh, what they intend to commit to it on the basis of not finding enough reserve projects. They tend to work on the basis of getting a quantum agreed by the Treasury and then working to that quantum rather than... Um, saying, oh, we haven't found enough reserved projects. And I've, as I've said, they don't always only fund reserved projects. They have funded devolved projects as well. Anyone w watching this at home, if there's anyone watching this at home, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll actually go, what on earth does that mean? So I think we have to get beneath all the gobbledygook and work out whether that was money that should have become the Scotland's regions or not. And if it should have been coming, then let's get it there. And if not, then I better understand it. And you can set the position 
when they come to the committee. So anything you can send to the committee that does not have gobbledygook in it, right? Uh, I mean that totally respectfully that we can just get, understand and run with, that would be incredibly helpful. Um, a couple of supplementaries before we close the evidence session. Monica Lennon. Thank you, convener. Well, if members of the public are listening at home, I think they might have agreed with the convener's earlier points about language uh, and not using terminology. People understand the language of jobs. And as we've sat here this morning, I've been thinking about recent job losses in, in Lanarkshire, East Brides, especially around uh, retail and manufacturing. So I wonder if we can end on a, a positive note, Cabinet Secretary, by hearing how many jobs um, have been created as a result of city region deals. Yeah, well, whilst I um, talk some gobbledygook, I'm sure we'd characterise that. Uh, Maura's going to get the exact figures. And each of the city deals has a figure attached to it for the number of jobs uh, that are sought to be created. Uh, uh, Maura will be able to provide that. Um, I think in relation to Clitmanshire, it was 1,500 uh, jobs were, were mentioned in the most recent one. However, it's true to say, as you've said, there have been a number of announcements, Midlothian's another one with Crummock uh, involved in it as well. But despite that, uh, each of one of those is very concerning for us, but very concerning for the individuals. But we do have this week unemployment figures, which are at you know pretty close to an all-time low. Uh, and in relation to uh, female unemployment and youth unemployment, lower than the rest of the UK. So... Nevertheless, each of those, especially the challenges in terms of retail, is very serious. Although, again, this morning we've seen growth in retail being announced by the Retail Consortium uh, faster in Scotland than the rest of the UK. Do you have the jobs figures? I don't. Uh, sorry, sorry to disappoint you, Cabinet Secretary. I don't have those uh, added up in my head, but I can certainly forward them on to the, the, the committee. Uh, what we have at the moment, uh, however, are the jobs that are expected to be created through the city deals. And obviously the deals are at a relatively early stage, so we do not yet have uh, definitive figures for what they will create over the longer term. So, so when we've agreed the deals, the local authorities have said what they expect will be the growth in the, and we can provide those figures to you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mr Simpson, just checking, are you okay? Do, do, do you want to end before I close this session? Uh, no, convener, you've covered my line of questioning very comprehensively. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, uh, all that remains for me to do is to actually thank the Cabinet Secretary and his officials for coming along here this morning. I should put again on record again that uh, we all hear from the UK government in relation to uh, their take on progress in relation to region deals at some point after the summer recess. So we look forward to that. But for the time being, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and both his officials. And we'll now move to agenda item two, which we previously agreed to take in private. Thank you. <laughs>